Unlike Libby, perhaps most of you may not know me. <laughs> I'm Deepak Prasad, Instructional Designer at Center for Flexible Learning. My presentation is going to be brief. I'm going to talk about two open education initiatives that my department is currently undertaking. Uh, the first one is on the open education website that we have been hearing about since this morning. And secondly, I will be showcasing our open textbook learning analytics system. So I'll begin with uh, the website. You could see our URL for the website is openedu, or you could say openedu.usp.ac.fj. Uh, since 7 a.m. this morning, the website was fully functional, <laughs> mobile friendly, and of course it is a work in progress and in near future we'll be updating the website. So let's hope it is still functional. Before I showcase the website, I want to point out some of the reasons that drove CFL to create this website. We don't do anything without reasons at CFL. We at CFL view the website as a platform to advocate, promote, and raise awareness to advocate about open education, open educational practices at the university. When I speak of the university, I speak of the Pacific as a whole. We want to provide a platform to the lecturers, the teachers, to find and easily access open educational resources. We want to provide teachers with support materials to enable them to repurpose existing OERs and share them under open license. We want to foster OER interest group at USP to share knowledge, to learn from our mistakes, that is important, to connect with practitioners within the university, and create a community of practice in the Pacific. And, of course, we want to get global recognition. We want to, we want to be recognized for our work. It is always nice to be recognized for our work. This plat uh, platform can give a place for lecturers, you and I, to put our work and get recognized from the international community and within the university and hopefully get some promotion. Now I'll quickly do a demo. Okay, our landing page um, gives a brief description about what open education is all about. I think uh, Professor Armstrong and Professor Naidu summed it up very well earlier this morning. We also provide additional resources for the ones who may be new to open education. It gives a good starting point to get uh, acquainted to open education what all education, open education is all about. On the next step, we provide a search engine. This search engine is provided in collaboration with Open Education Consortium, and through this search engine, there are 70,000 plus resources available. So I will quickly do a demo of how the search engine works, and I think all of you are familiar with how search engine works. So, uh, that is the search results on the search term accounting. It has found uh, 73 resources, and lecturers and students can scroll through these resources, view, and get access to these resources. Uh, this is the first resource which is opening up and it points to a course syllabus, course outline of a particular course which is being offered by Saila Foundation. We are also providing a list of repositories 
even a larger list of repositories to enable wider search. So if you're not able to find anything through the search engine, you could go through this list of repositories and you could do search based on these individual repositories and sites. So that is basically about um, finding resources through our search engine. So the next question we were asking ourselves is that once a lecturer finds a particular resource, what they would want to do with it? What is the first thing they would want to do with it? Perhaps you may agree with me that you would want to evaluate a particular resource. You want to determine the quality and whether it will result in a productive curriculum and teaching resources for your courses. So we have provided a guideline, a checklist, a list of things teachers could go through in order to evaluate the resource they have found. So th there are a list of uh, things uh, categorized under four or five uh, categories, relevance, accuracy, uh, production quality, accessibility, integrity, and licensing. So once you found a resource, you have evaluated a resource, you may want to repurpose it. You could uh, combine various resources and remix it. And these uh, resources may carry different licenses. So how will you go about combining these licenses to to share your work. So in order to provide a little bit understanding on how to combine different licenses, we have given um, a guideline, a matrix. For example, if you use a CC by attribution license and use that work, you repurpose it, you remix it, then what are the type of license licenses you could release it under? So basically, CC BY is the most flexible type of license. Once you use it, you repurpose it, it could be licensed in any type, any of the six types of licenses. So basically, that is how you're going to read the table, the original work you have used, and how it can be licensed. You may notice that um, for non-derivatives, you can't do anything with that because you cannot basically make any changes to it. So you just have to use it as it is. If you're going to use it in your courses, probably it's a good idea to create a link to those resources. There's also a video further explaining on how to create, uh, how to uh, combine creative common licenses. By the way, uh, CC licenses are now becoming a default open license for open education resources. So whenever we talk about OERs, we need to talk about creative common licenses because what makes resources open it is the open license and open licenses is basically about open access and free access and it gives you permissions in advance to repurpose your resources unlike traditional copyright traditional copyright has got two pillars it restricts you from copying and distributing Whereas with open education resources, with, or with any open resource, you have got advanced permission to copy and distribute. The restrictions comes when you want to repurpose it. So the two, most of the, two, two of the most restrictive licenses elements are non-derivative and non-commercial. Non-commercial basically means if you use a resource, you repurpose it, You can't sell it. By that I mean you can't sell it for a profit. The university could sell it to the students to recover the cost, but we can't resell it to make profit. So that is basically on the page on uh, combining licenses. The next thing we need to be careful is when we use resources, we need to attribute it. So we have provided a link to a wiki page which gives good, bad, and ugly examples of how to attribute it. So uh, this uh, 
A page will give you some examples on how to properly attribute open resources. And to provide support to our teachers, we have made a direct link to Commonwealth of Learning's uh, Open Educational Resource Workshop. This is a self-paced workshop. If any staff wants to learn more about it, or you want to relearn about what you have been practicing, uh, you could go and enroll in this workshop and you could do it in your own pace. So basically, in a nutshell, this is all, our, this is all what our website is about. We have started with a plan, and in the near future, we will be adding more information, more tools uh, to create community of practice, to get feedback from the users, etc. So basically, this is about the website. The next thing I want to talk about is the open textbooks learning analytics systems. I think from Ian's uh, presentation this morning, it is clear that now USP is moving towards open textbooks. One obvious advantage of open textbooks is cost reduction for students. We at CFL acknowledge that, but we are in the business of asking the hard questions. Open textbooks, either we develop it in-house within the university or we use it from elsewhere. Cost is involved, time is spent. So the things we need to know is, are our students really using these textbooks, if they are at all? Some of the questions we are asking at CFL are, to what extent, if any, do open textbooks influence the amount and method in which students engage with their open textbooks? If we provide them with free textbooks, we want to know whether they are actually using it and how they are engaging with the open textbooks. The next thing we are asking is, are the aspects of openness, the element of open, Besides excess advantages, benefit student learning? If you are providing open textbooks to students, does it benefit student learning? To answer this question, we have uh, created a prototype for open textbooks. And it is a basically a prototype which is based on the idea of learning analytics. So for this demonstration, I would request you if you could um, take out your devices and access the URL. It is a URL to our open textbook and start interacting with it. So once you have accessed the open textbook, you'll be asked to enter your username and student ID. I hope a couple of you could uh, access the website. Uh, for this uh, demo purpose, it's for everybody uh, present here. Okay, for the student ID, I think you're already in, right? Okay. For student ID, your student ID, we start with the letter S because at the USP we start with our student ID with S. Number seven, and put your mobile phone numbers. So it is going to be letter S with eight digits. Letter S, number seven, and your phone numbers. If you still have not been able to access, uh, the URL is back on the screen. I will just give you a couple of minutes to uh, test the textbook out and probably engage and use it, and we'll see what happens next.
Okay, then I think I will demonstrate the analytic system and how it works. Some of you have accessed the site today. So it will show you the analysis from a start date to an end date. So you could pick a range of dates. So for our papers, uh, it's just today. So I can see at least a couple of people who have accessed the site. There's a class list. And now to view the report. You can view the report individually, per student, or as a whole class. <laughs> so let's uh, look at the whole class report. Please note, this is still a work in progress. We are, doing, we are trying to do something new. So the first analysis shows you the, the chapter numbers and the number of views to those chapters. Chapter 6 was viewed 29 times. Copyright page 12 times. Chapter 4, 9 times. So what, what, it, what this shows is that from the total of whole class, these chapters were reviewed. If you're teaching a class, and suppose you prescribe a reading from chapter 1, so you expect your students to go and read chapter 1. Not any other chapters. This is one way of tracking your students' progress and taking remedial actions to identify at-risk students. So that was the first analysis, looking at the chapter views. From the textbook, you could also do bookmarks. Unlike traditional textbooks, you, dog, you do a dog fold kind of thing on the books. Is it dog ear fold or something? I don't know. Dog ear fold. <laughs> With this... Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, this shows that, um, okay, from the whole class, someone did a bookmark on chapter one and another bookmark was done on copyright page. Uh, this is important to know what the students are bookmarking. Perhaps um, they are bookmarking a page because the content was difficult, they need more time to read it. Or perhaps uh, this particular section of the book was prescribed, was given as a prescribed reading. So there are va various things, uh, various reasons that could uh, uh, come out of it. And in the textbook, there are also links to outside resources. When I talk about non-derivatives, you provide a link to this non-derivative resources. So just providing a link directly to the non-derivatives. So I think we didn't have enough time for people to go and access this. OK. Uh, this shows the browsers that were used. So someone has used Chrome. <laughs> someone is on Mac. And again, Chrome and the version of Chrome. So uh, this, again, is important because within the Pacific, uh, most of our users are Windows-based users. And maybe a small proportion are on Mac, so when we are creating any resources, we need to make sure it is accessible through all the platforms and browsers. And then again, the devices that were used. And again, this textbook was provided in an online mode, which you have just accessed through the internet. And it is also downloadable. You can download it on your device and use it in offline mode. But then again, if you're using it, uh, using it in offline mode, all your interactions is going to be synchronized and thrown back on this uh, system. But for our purpose, it was just an online demonstration. So you can see only offline interactions. And I think someone from CFL has accessed the offline, but that is why you're, you can see this. So you can see three people used the offline text in offline mode, and while majority of them access it through the internet. This is really important uh, 
expect of um, providing e-textbooks because we are need to be used without access to the internet. So basically, uh, this is the system we are uh, currently working on. And am I running over time? And we expect it. Uh, we expect to further develop it and work with the open textbook working group and see how we could work together and see if we could implement uh, such things if there's a need for that. So that is basically my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.